May 3rd, 2019, almost five years ago, we saw the release of the War of the Spark set, which changed a few design concepts in Planeswalkers and overall has shaped future releases of Magic the Gathering sets and how they're presented to us and kind of making them a little bit more of like a, a grander display, you know, than what they were, at least at the time, you know, where we would get some trailers and stuff like that for sets, but, you know, this really like changed the game in terms of like what was happening and kind of like this cool Easter eggs and spoilers and stuff that you would see in like those trailers and stuff were really neat. And it's been, a, it's something that like lives in my mind rent free because honestly, on top of like one of the most beautiful trailers I think Magic has ever put out for anything. It also has probably like one of the best cover songs like ever covering one of Linkin Park's songs in the end. And it just still something I listen to to this day. But of course, from the gameplay side of things and from the competitive side of things, the set also introduced a lot of Planeswalkers that ended up seeing a decent amount of play in the competitive formats, you know, for standard at the time, all the way to modern legacy and even vintage. So to kind of give you a few examples, you know, we have Teferi Time Raveler, which I think is one of the most egregious ones. And, you know, we had Nicol Bolas, the Dragon God, who saw us like sparing play in standard, but then ended up actually seeing play in Pioneer in, you know, some of the Fires of Inventions decks and then later Mono Green Devotion, thanks to the help of Oath of Nyssa, which is kind of like a non-bow, like canonically, because I'm sure Nyssa is not meant to help the big bad and one of the biggest bads that we've seen in the Magic story in quite a while, you know, minus like the Phyrexians and stuff as we kind of like finish up that part of the lore and stuff. But really, probably one of the biggest and one of the most egregious Planeswalkers that got printed and has seen like a ton of play and even recently got banned is Karn the Great Creator. And while as a standard card in, in these more limited formats, the card is okay because of the tools that are available to it. But of course, as you get older and as you dive deeper into some of these other formats, you see that Karn the Great Creator is absolutely nuts in the different combinations that it brings to the table and what exactly it's able to do and what we've seen it do over the years since it's been printed. So today with this video, we're gonna talk about Karn the Great Creator. We're gonna talk about exactly why it's probably one of the best Planeswalkers from that set and one of the best Planeswalkers of all time, kind of with an asterisk next to its name and again we'll explain all that stuff as we get into the video but of course if you're not already subscribed to the channel and you want to see more videos like this you want to see more modern pioneer content and so on please consider subscribing to the channel and ring notification bell so you know when those videos get posted if you go down in the description down below you'll see a link to my discord server go ahead and join over there as well without further ado let's go ahead and take a look at karn the great creator and dissect this card and properly assess why it's probably one of the most busted planeswalkers ever printed so here we have Karn the Great Creator, and it was probably blessed with one of the best static abilities put on Planeswalkers. So kind of a gimmick for the War of the Spark set was the fact that Planeswalkers were being printed at all different rarities. You had a few that were at uncommon, you had some at rare, and then you had three at mythic rare, which was kind of where we would typically see Planeswalkers for the foreseeable future, you know, since we had the original Lorewind 5, which can be another video for another day, you know, whatever. Essentially, with Karn the Great Creator and a lot of these other Planeswalkers, they had varying amounts of abilities depending on what rarity they were printed at, and then they had a different static ability on all Planeswalkers. They all had a static ability, and it's something that we see on cards, you know, going forward. You know, we see with the new Oko where you can copy one of your creatures on your turn, and then, you know, Jace, which actually has a downside as, like, a static ability, and some other ones, like uh, one of the Chandras got printed saying it couldn't be countered, you know, and that was like a static ability on the card. So the design space has been kind of explored past just having an effect when it is on the board. And Karn the Great Creator arguably got one of the best ones. So Karn the Great Creator is a, a four mana, you know, four generic mana Planeswalker with five loyalty. It's a lot of loyalty for a Planeswalker. And it has the static ability of activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. And that's going to be an important thing to remember as we go over some of these cards that, you know, help Karn the Great Creator kind of become this insatiable beast that will absolutely just destroy any hope you have of like trying to win any of your games. So plus one until end of turn up to one target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness equal 
to its converted mana cost. So already right off the rip, you know, we have these dual land, you know, artifact lands. Of course, we have stuff like Dark Seal Citadel. Then you have even the monocolored artifact lands, which are still banned in modern, at least at the time of this recording. You know, hopefully maybe they'll see the light of day one day. But thanks to Karn, you know, those lands your mana rocks, you know, your any of your other artifacts and maybe go and actually do something, Karn is going to shut off immediately, you know, when it comes into play. And his plus one is going to turn them into creatures, which can make them susceptible to removal. Or in some cases, if they're a zero converted mana cost card, you're just going to be able to blow them up because it'll be a zero zero creature. It'll die to state based actions, which we'll see from, you know, probably the most broken ability from Karn, you know, when we get to it here in a minute. But just on those itself, like, I mean, getting to have a one-sided Null Rod for four mana is okay. When, you know, when we see formats like Vintage and Legacy kind of relying more on some of the broken artifacts, stuff like Grim Monolith, Mana Crypt, you know, the Moxes if you're in Legacy, Black Lotus, things like that, even Time Vault as well. You know, we see those cards and they're very powerful. Uh, obviously, the reason why they're restricted in Vintage some of those cards being restricted in vintage and you can essentially if like play this your opponent's not going to be able to add mana with them and you think well i can just get rid of the karn well till then karn can just plus on like those moxen on your black lotus what have you and then end up blowing them up and getting them off the board so it's like virtually a removal spell for those things of course we also know other uh, other sets and other cards that create like treasure tokens map tokens blood tokens so on and karn's just going to be able to stop them from being activated and can just pick them off one by one you know with his plus one ability but of course, while that stuff is great, dandy, wonderful, we know that the real power of Karn is in his minus two ability, which says that you can choose an artifact card you own from outside the game or in exile, which is something that can come up and will come up here in a minute. Uh, you reveal that card and you put that card in your hand. So this is where we kind of like crack the knuckles, we crack our neck here, we, you know, buckle up our seat belts because uh, this is where the ride really begins. So we know with Karn that there are some very powerful combinations of cards and some very powerful things that Karn has enabled. When this card kind of came out, this was before Pioneer was really a format. I believe people were playing, you know, something like uh, po maybe Postmod or something like that, where it was like M15 forward, you know, of course, Pioneer's Return of Ravnica forward. But uh, Karn the Great Creator got its start really being played in modern in the Tron decks, which really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because Tron absolutely loves Karn. Preferably the ones without pants, because apparently the ones without pants are broken. So Karn the Great Creator in modern notably had a very powerful combo with it, which was going and getting the card Michelson's Lattice. And Michelson's Lattice turned everything into artifacts and then said mana could be of Mana of any color could be spent to cast spells and activate abilities as though it was mana of any color. So essentially, it made everything colorless and it made everything artifacts. Well, in conjunction with Karn the Great Creator, when you have that card in play with a Karn the Great Creator, your opponent can't cast spells or activate abilities or do anything. Even tap their lands for mana, they can't do it. And you might think like, oh, well, if Force of Vigor later got printed and stuff, maybe I can just use Force of Vigor. And you can't because it just removes all the color. So you can't even cast Force of Vigor. You only thing you can do is attack and block if you have a board state. And you could get into these situations where if you were playing the mirror, where you had two Karn the Great Creators and someone played a Lattice, you were both locked out of the game. So very quickly, or I shouldn't even say very quickly, you know, they, it lasted for a little bit. It was something that was very powerful to do, you know, lock your opponent out of the game, put a few more lock pieces in play. Eventually your opponent just can't do anything. They can't attack. They can't do anything. So then Karn the Great Creator just ends up finding a win condition, and then you end up winning the game that way. So Michelson's Lattice got banned. Okay, you know, that was one of the more busted, probably the most busted thing you could do with Karn the Great Creator. Now it's kind of a little bit more of a fair card. Maybe it's going to see a little bit of play. You know, it still gets some pretty powerful artifacts, but it's not going to be as good as what it was. And boy, were they wrong, because as sets have kind of been released, and as we've seen more product come out, we have some more powerful combinations of cards to go get with Karn the Great Creator. So starting in Pioneer, as that format kind of came to fruition, uh, Karn really wasn't adopted in the mono green strategies, you know, until more like later where we would see kind of like this Explorer package, you know, mixed in with like this Devotion era where we can just create a ton of mana with like Karn and then go and get some very powerful cards out of our sideboard. 
but as the game kind of developed we had some more powerful you know creatures that had just a ton of green mana symbols printed into them to make our devotion strategy produce even more mana and Karn kind of taking center stage in that along with Kiora. So probably what you're all going to get at is like by accident, uh, they found a way to create infinite mana essentially with Karn the Great Creator. And that's uh, pairing it with a card like the Chain Veil, which allows you to activate it repeatedly. You know, you can activate it, you know, for four mana and tapping it to give your Planeswalkers an additional activation. And while you think that it would only matter for the Planeswalkers on the battlefield, it actually just let you activate all Planeswalkers an additional time, regardless if they were on the battlefield when this card, like when the ability resolved or not. So essentially with that and uh, being able to get Pestilent Cauldron from your sideboard and cast Restorative Burst, which is on the back side of the card, you were able to loop Karn and Kiora, as long as your devotion, I think, was like 15, like 14 or 15. You had enough mana that you could untap the Chain Veil so you can get a ton of activations to the point where you could activate Kiora and, uh, you know, enough times to put her in the graveyard. And, of course, activate Karn enough times to put her, him in the graveyard and get enough activations to where you can essentially generate infinite mana. And then with Karn the Great Creator, you go and get the card Stone Brain. And Stone Brain let you name cards and exile them from your opponent's deck or you know from i believe target player or maybe his opponent either way like you were going to target your opponent with this and then you were going to name every single card in their deck until and if they had one card in hand you just win the game because then you name every card that they possibly have and then you name the card in their hand and then they're forced to draw a card so then they end up losing the game that way and that was something that was kind of discovered on accident of course there was uh, different ways to win really before that but then that became the preferred method up until you know Car and the Great Creator got banned. And of course, it didn't just stop at having combo pieces. It had plenty of other utility cards that were in the deck that you could play to just shore up some matchups and stuff. Well, when I talk about Car and the Great Creator, I talk about Car and the Great Creator essentially making your artifacts like cost four more mana. You know, like that that's the cost of playing it is having to resolve the spell and they're going to cost four extra mana on the turn that you play them. So well, I think it makes it a little bit more fair because I'm sure the idea was to get some bigger, you know, bigger artifacts from like your sideboard and it made them vulnerable to your opponent being able to maybe cast, you know, untap on their turn and hold up counter spell, maybe cast like a discard spell, something of that nature. Just gave them an extra turn to find a way to stop whatever you were trying to tutor for without, you know, with without uh, you really you getting to slam the card on that turn typically. Uh, at least making it a lot harder to do that. And from what we saw from Karn the Great Creator, especially in like Pioneer, you know, we saw that, you know, Arcalite Phoenix was a deck that people were playing in some of these other graveyard strategies. So Karn the Great Creator could go to something like Tormod's Crypt, and you had essentially just graveyard hate for those decks, like essentially in your main deck. Again, you had to spend four mana for it, but, you know, you're playing Tormod's Crypt in your sideboard anyway, so you might as well, you know, I guess continue to play it and you get to play Karn the Great Creator as a result to not only have this very powerful combo that you can enable but then also be able to go and get something like a Tormod's Crypt if you need to to be able to survive a few extra turns to set up your combo. Uh, going even further you know you had Darksteel Citadel in there to ensure that you had a land drop for that turn. You had plenty of other things that you could get just other silver bullets that were going to help shore up other matchups and that is probably one of the best tools of Karn the Great Creator. You know, I know we talked about, you know, getting Lattice and locking your opponent out of the game. And we talked about having an infinite combo if you had enough devotion. But even just past that, Karn the Great Creator is such a grindy, almost mid-rangey slash control planeswalker just from all the other stuff it gets to do. So Pioneer, you know, you see like Sky Sovereign, you see the Iska's Cherry and all these other things that you could do to like try and win the game pass something like that and of course you could use a plus ability on those vehicles make them creatures they're going to attack and you're going to be able to get like their triggers and everything like that as well so pretty neat kind of like uh synergy combo whatever you want to call it uh, for car the great creator to essentially make your vehicles even better you don't have to actually pay to crew them you can just plus on them and attack your opponent of course continuing to lock out some of their pieces when we go to modern and some of the older formats and we're going to talk about modern for a second because legacy and vintage are going to be a little bit easier, I would think. 
in modern, of course, you had the, the lattice combo and then lattice got banned. So now you're wondering, well, what do we do? So from there, like the the different Karn decks and the, you know, Tron decks and then now, you know, Muddle Black like Coffers and stuff being able to play like Karn the Great Creator generate a ton of mana in its own way that is not by getting three different lands on the battlefield. You know, you'd see things like Liquid Metal Coating, which in conjunction with this plus one could start blowing up lands. Liquid Metal Coating turns something into an artifact in addition to its other types. So then Karn is going to be able, so it's going to be able to target your opponent's lands. And, you know, with Karn, it's going to stop them from being able to activate it. But on top of that too, Karn can then plus on that land and blow it up. And it's something that was pretty popular and something that honestly is very satisfying to do. Uh, not fun when you're on the other side of it, but when you're the one doing it, it is a lot of fun to just blow up someone's lands. You can, you know, target their creatures with liquid metal coating, you know, if they have some very powerful activated abilities and you could shut them off that way. And that was kind of, you know, the extent of like liquid metal coating pretty bad overall. If it's, you know, if you don't have a Karn the great creator and with Karn the great creator, it's one of your best hits, you know, to actually get with Karn the great creator. Um, on top of that, too, you had some other lock pieces that with having Tron, and again, you're you're adding four mana to whatever you're going and getting. You have cards like Ensnaring Bridge, you had Chalice of the Void, you have Tormod's Crypt, even still, that you can get in Modern. You had Engineered Explosives. You had these cards that had their niches, but were very, very good, like once they hit the table. You know, Ensnaring Bridge, stopping your opponent from attacking, pressuring your life total. You know, you're generating a ton of mana, so unless you're flooded with threats, which in some cases can be a good thing, you know, unless your opponent's like absolutely beating you down, you don't have something like a worm coil engine or whatever, you know, you're going to be able to just kind of throw haymakers until your opponent gets knocked out, or you're going to be able to play all of your things and then like fill up your hand when they get past their combat and then empty it again on your turn. Some combination of that to just make it so Ensnaring Bridge is kind of like a hard lock from your point of being able to attack. You know, Chalice of the Void and things like Engineer Explosives, you'd see more in like the Cascade decks. Of course, like Engineer Explosives can get rid of Rhinos, can get rid of some other annoying like zero cost things that are on the battlefield. But mainly you'd see those for like Cascade decks. You'd see Defense Grid if you're playing against Control. There would be kind of the split of players playing four one ring in the main, three, you know, three one ring in the main board, and then one on the side, which I think is one of the more controversial things to kind of uh, think about. I mean, when you're playing a card like Karn the Great Creator, and uh, some of the things that you can do with that card, you know, uh, the one ring, I think personally, you should just play four in, in your main, but there are people that play three and one. So essentially, you have seven rings in your total main board between four Karn and then three that are already there. Uh, you have the uh, Cityscape Leveler and Sundering Titan, which are kind of like the, the closers of choice for like those Tron decks to like blow up your opponent's board, get rid of some of their mana. And then of course, like Cityscape Leveler, you're just getting rid of like those problematic permanents. And with Karn on the battlefield, they're not going to be able to tap their power stones for mana or anything. So then Karn can blow those up while Cityscape Leveler makes more tokens and you know, beats your opponent down, and eventually, even if they're able to out the leveler, or they're out, able to out the Karn or whatever, they still got to figure out what they're going to do with the other one. So Karn just becomes a very annoying Planeswalker, you know, when, again, the turn that you play it, you're able to get something impactful, like one of those lock pieces that we talked about, force your opponent to have an answer for one of those, because other than that, they can't win the game or pressure, the, or pressure your Karn, the great creator, and then following it up with another activation of Karn to go get something like a Titan, a Cityscape Leveler, maybe go get a One Ring, you know, if that's your thing, Sky Sovereign, Pestilent Cauldron, what have you. Whatever format fits the bill, you know, especially for like the modern and, you know, formerly the Pioneer format since it got banned, uh, it was very powerful. It enabled a lot of broken things to happen. Degeneracy ensued, which is something that Magic players are definitely known for when, you know, breaking cards that have something that is inherently powerful uh going further you know we go into legacy and vintage formats that like we really don't play on this channel you know we really don't touch them unless we absolutely have to but as i said in the beginning you know you have like moxen and black lotus you have other powerful artifacts that are available to you in vintage that other people don't really get to play of course like uh, grim monolith and you know mana vault and things like that uh that are very powerful to stop with like car and the great creator 
you know, in conjunction to the fact that it has a built-in null rod for just your opponent's things, it allows you to play, you know, Black Lotus, your Moxon, and things like that, and, you know, generate a ton of mana, get a Karn early on the board, go and get a Chalice of the Void, so you not only stop your opponent from being able to cast those spells, that they're able to somehow out the Karn, or what have you, in some way, you know, you're going to be able to counter them and you already got all yours out, so you're not even really worried about it and you have so much mana in play that now when you minus Karn again, you're able to go and get a win condition or a further lock piece to basically make it impossible for your opponent to play the game of Magic. And of course, in Legacy, while we it's not the most popular thing to do because we see a lot of like Reanimator and you see a lot of like Beanstalk control, uh, for a while there, there was like this a mono black like control deck that was playing Karn, essentially getting to do the same thing where it's getting some uh, various different lock pieces to basically put your opponent like on the back foot and force them to have to out multiple pieces before they're able to actually try and win the game. But then you're able to kind of like push through and win the game with stuff like Orcish Bowmaster, which makes it hard for your opponents to cast Brainstorms, Ponders, Preordains, and play their One Rings. On top of that, two card can be able to get the One Ring and so on. So this card just having a multitude of uses and of course, you know, getting better and better in each mode and part of this card getting better and better the older that you go. And of course, with the, you know, the nature of being a colorless planeswalker where the cost isn't very restricted because literally anybody can play this card, you know, anybody can play this card and it costs almost nothing to create this Karn sideboard package because as we even said, even in Pioneer, you have some very powerful silver bullets in your sideboard to go get that can help you shore up any of the matchups that you're just honestly not sure of that maybe you're like, okay, this is going to increase some percentage points for me. And there are cards that you can play with Karn the Great Creator after you've already cast a card and you spent most, if not all, of your mana to play that card, especially in some of the other matchups where, you know, the Phoenix decks and, you know, like Living End and things like that, where, you know, you can go get a Tormod's Crypt and your opponent is not going to be able to get back their Phoenixes, get back their creatures. And again, you can just leave it on the battlefield until it becomes relevant and gives you something to do the turn that you play Karn if you don't have a way to generate a ton of mana like most of the decks like Tron and like Mono Black Control are able to do. So that's kind of where the asterisk for Karn the Great Creator is. Like while in a vacuum by itself, just a card by itself, you know, a pretty powerful static ability for the older formats, you know, in some of the newer formats, I wouldn't say it's like super relevant, but it can come up. And a plus one that, you know, again, without really any help, you're only going to be able to up artifact lands, which don't really see a lot of play in modern, you know, and in the formats that they do see playing, Karn the Great Creator does not really does not exist in those formats and on top of that too you know you get to blow up you know other tokens which you know again can be annoying but you're not really stopping anything you know like uh, of course like your plus is then going to have to go after you know your own artifacts which makes them susceptible to removal and stuff which is a viable like win condition is a viable way that you can win the game but karn is like the definition of a planeswalker that absolutely needs to feed off and thrive off of everything else that is kind of around it you know again while it is po it is powerful it, very powerful abilities of course it, and it only gets better the more formats or rather the more sets and the older you go back in formats and the more higher power level of the formats you're in Karn's going to be able to get more cards and Karn is just going to be able to find the most busted things to get and put them into play typically on like on the same turn if not in the worst case just getting something that can help it survive another turn to then go and get the piece that can just slam and win the game uh notably uh this card does let you get things from exile so uh, while I didn't really explain it, uh, technically the backside of Pestilent Cauldron in Restorative Burst exiles itself, but it exiles it on the front half, which is how you're able to continually loop that card is because Pestilent Cauldron is an artifact. It's going to get exiled because of Restorative Burst on that side, so you're able to go and get it. On top of that, too, you know, you have uh, just these other effects that end up exiling artifacts. You know, Haywire Might, we saw a play in the Pro Tour, the modern Pro Tour, where uh, the Lord of the Rings Pro Tour, uh, how many times can you say Pro Tour? Uh, in the Lord of the Rings Pro Tour, where we actually saw uh, one of the players use a Haywire Might to exile their ring 
to then be able to play a Karn and go get a ring to reestablish the protection of it. So it's very versatile in what it's able to do. Of course, you're able to do that if your opponent does it, but then, you know, it's, it's pretty neat when you're actually able to do it and stuff. And it's actually a match that we kind of reviewed and, and went over and talked about as probably potentially one of the greatest matches of all, well, at least game four being like one of the best games like ever played on camera. So overall, that is Karn the Great Creator and really it's probably it's argument for being one of the greatest planeswalkers ever printed and again like you kind of have to look at these older formats to be able to see like the true power and the true capability of a card like this but you know all the other planeswalkers and stuff like they are contextually you know very powerful i think if you print like oko mainskin boo things like that into the format you know like standard right now i think they'd be very good planeswalkers you know where Karn the Great Creator, I don't think would even be like on their level. I don't think it could really touch them. But, you know, if you then injected some very powerful artifacts, which you actually see some from the Outlaws of Thunder Junction set, then maybe Karn the Great Creator could uh, maybe try to tread water, you know, compared to those Planeswalkers. But yeah, that's going to do it for the video. I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of Karn the Great Creator, if it was a mistake. You know, again, personally, I really like the design of cards that allow you to go into your sideboard and get things i just think karn the great creator is just way too versatile and what it actually does and you know it's just not restrictive enough i think and i think wish cards should uh maybe necessarily be like limited to like what they can get or if they're going to be more broad they should be a little bit more expensive and there should be some kind of a uh, built-in restriction whether it's in the cost or like in the ability of the card so but with any of that you know with all that said you know again let me know in the comments down below what you think of Karn the great creator if there's a planeswalker another card I should check out another set things like that you know i would love any and all ideas here from the community and everything that we've built because uh we're growing pretty rapidly and honestly it's awesome to see y'all are killing it crushing it and it keeps me motivated to keep making videos and try to come up with different ideas and new things to try out so really appreciate it again subscribe to the channel ring notification bell if you haven't already join the discord server with the link down below in the description that's gonna be me this video hope you all enjoyed and i hope to see you all in the next one